Hey team, Dr. Jack Orty, and today I'm going to take you through a really cool scientific technique called a cytokine bead assay. And that's because it's really important that you guys understand the methods of science so you can delve into the research yourself and find out even more if you want to. So let's cover a cytokine bead assay. Um, I'll just quickly tell you the goal of a cytokine bead assay is to measure the amount of loads of different cytokines simultaneously in a sample. So that's the goal of a cytokine bead assay. I want to measure the levels of a bunch of different cytokines, which are inflammatory signaling molecules, simultaneously in the same sample. How do I do that? Well, I've actually got to tell you about a different technique first, so you can understand the machines that we use to run a cytokine bead assay. So I'm going to do a quick dive into flow cytometry. This is another staple of the uh, of immunology, right? Flow cytometry, you almost can't pick up an immunology paper without looking at flow cytometry. I'm going to create another video that's dedicated to flow cytometry at a later date. Um, uh, but I just, because there's a lot more to it than what I'm about to cover, but I'm just going to give you some quick details so you can understand how the machine works, because the cytokine bead assay actually uses a flow cytometry machine to do its analysis. So let's jump into it. Here's a flow cytometry machine. It's very, very cool. Now it's going to suck the liquid up into here or into here, and then it runs that liquid into this giant machine here to run the assay. So let's see what that looks like. Now, you can do a flow cytometry either on a tube, and inside this tube will contain a bunch of cells, um, or you can do it in a 96 well plane. Each of those wells will contain a bunch of cells. Now, those cells will have been labeled with an antibody or several antibodies, and attached to those antibodies will be a fluorophore, you know, a fluorescent uh, compound that will fluoresce under different light conditions. So what happens is here we've got the machine, a pipe literally shoots down, it's really cool, and we'll suck up the liquid that contains the cells. And what will happen is here we've got the cells here, and this is a really zoomed in version. Essentially the machine will shuttle the cells through a very thin tube such that it can view pretty much one cell at a time, right? So it's going to funnel them through so that they come through one at a time so it can look and probe each one of those cells one at a time. It does this incredibly quickly, like tens of thousands of cells um, every 10 seconds or so. You know, it goes through thousands of cells very quickly. So they go through this tube to be looked at. What do we mean by looked at? Well, the first thing that happens actually is light. Essentially, a, la a very narrow uh, light laser beam will be shot through uh, the path in which the cells are going. And what it's looking for is absorption of light, right? Um, and so here we've got the light, it's coming in, and you can see more light is hitting the cell than is coming through out the other side, right? And that's because the cell is absorbing, but also scattering uh, a lot of the light. And this drop in light that hits the sensor, so we know how much light is being emitted by the laser, and we know that not that much light is coming out the other side, um, is called forward scatter, and it corresponds to the cell size. The bigger the cell, the more light it's going to block out. It's almost like a shadow, right? The bigger the cell, the bigger the shadow, right? So the less light that comes out the other side. The next involves those fluorophores. So in a previous video, I covered immunohistochemistry, where we have an antibody with a fluorescent probe attached to it, and that antibody will only bind to a single protein, that we want it to. Um, so here we have a slice of tissue, and the antibody is bound to this specific protein here under this tissue. So now when we shoot a laser at it, we shoot a blue laser at it, the blue laser will hit all of the tissue and bounce off. So we're going to end up with blue light in, blue light out. But where it hits this fluorophore, the blue light will turn into green light, right? Uh, the blue wavelength gets absorbed by the fluorophore, and then a green wavelength is emitted by the fluorophore. So now if we have a filter, and this filter filters out the blue light so we can't see it, we will only see the green light, which means we will only see where there is an antibody in this tissue, right? So the blue light comes in, hits the fluorophore, comes out green, that goes through the filter, so now we can see where that antibody is, but not anything else in the tissue. 
a very similar technology can be used in flow cytometry. So the cells are covered in proteins and we can use antibodies to probe those proteins. So in this case, an antibody has bound to this cell, but not these cells, right? So it's a specific antibody, obviously for a protein that's only present on this cell. So the cell goes through and with that cell, we detect how much light it absorbs, right? And then with that same cell, we then shoot it with a different laser that goes through the filter. So the blue light comes out, there is a filter that blocks all the blue light, and then the green light comes through to the sensor. So now we know how big the cell is and whether it fluoresced green or not. Um, now, in a flow cytometry machine, there are loads of laser colors and there are loads of filters and there are loads of sensors. So we can measure lots of different fluorophores, which means we can look at, um, we can use an antibody with a different fluorophore for loads of different probes. So you can imagine a situation where we have a fluorescent antibody that marks a B cell, a fluorescent antibody that marks a T cell, a fluorescent antibody that marks a monocyte, and we can run it through our machine, and one might be blue, one might be green, and one might be yellow, and so we can measure how many of each of those cell types we've got using this machine. Now in the actual machine, instead of a filter, often there is a mirror, and that mirror will only reflect a specific wavelength of light, and it will let all the other wa uh, wavelengths go through. So here you can see it acts kind of like a filter and a mirror all in one. This one only reflects blue light, this one only reflects green light, this one only reflects yellow light. And it's such a clever technique that allows us to look at a number of fluorescent colors all simultaneously on a single cell. So now we then graph that, right? So on the y-axis here, I've got the forward scatter. So that's how big the cell is, roughly. And on the x-axis here, we've got fluorescence. So did it have the antibody or not? And in this case, I've said, let's say the antibody is for the MHC2 protein, which is present on the surface of antigen-presenting cells. So here we have a cell. The cell is big, and it expresses MHC2. So um, we can see it's big and positive for MHC2. That sounds a lot like a macrophage, because macro means big, phage means eater. Macrophage is a big cell that eats and then displays those antigens. So this big cell that's green is probably a macrophage. Here we have a small cell that doesn't have MHC2. So um, it could be any of a number of cells that are small and don't express MHC2. Maybe it's a T cell, and we would need another antibody to figure that one out. Um, but over here, we've got one that's very fluorescent, but it's small. Um, so we now have a single cell that has a lot of green label on it, but it's very small. Um, and one might guess that that's a monocyte, right? So monocytes are small antigen-presenting cells that um, you can go into the tissue and then swell up and turn into macrophages. So um, they are small versions of macrophages is a very simplistic view. Oh, I'm going to get beaten up by a monocyte biologist for that. But yeah, so uh, we, can, we can now clearly delineate at least three different cell populations in our graph. But we do this, remember, thousands upon thousands of times. So this is an actual flow cytometry graph, and each blue dot represents a cell. And if there's two cells on top of each other, they bump the color up a bit to light blue. If there's three cells on top of each other, it goes to green and to yellow and to red. So the highest density of cells are in red here, for example. We've got the MHC2 antibody here, so and the size of the cell here on the y-axis. So we can see we've got lots of cells that aren't expressing MHC2 and are small. So these might be um, all the T cells, but you know they could also be fibroblasts or neurons, it depends on what tissue you put through it. It could be hepatocytes, you name it. It could be any of those things, right? Here we've got a huge number of MHC2 positive cells that are small, so that's a lot of monocytes. So maybe we're looking in the blood, I don't know, you can start to guess what tissue this is. And then up here we have the large cells that are expressing MHC2 in our macrophages. And what you can do in the software, which is actually kind of cool, you can draw a box around it and go, oh, so 2%, 2.7% of all the dots are macrophages. So you could say 2%, 2.7% of my cells are macrophages. Then you could give a treatment and see if you end up with more or less macrophages, for example. An example might be 
Often when macrophages are signaling inflammatory signaling, they kill themselves in a process called pyroptosis in order to release as many cytokines as possible. They fill themselves up with cytokines and then pop. Um, so if we had conditions that initiated macrophages, uh, macrophage pyroptosis, we might have another graph right beside it in which there are none of these cells. So now we know that we've induced pyroptosis. And this is a real quick overview of flow cytometry. Although I've got to say it's not bad. I thought it was going to be pretty basic, but that's, that's worked out quite well. So why am I telling you this if I'm supposed to be telling you about a cytokine bead assay? So let me jump into a cytokine bead assay. A cytokine bead assay is essentially an ELISA on a synthetic bead. So a company goes out and they make a synthetic bead and you basically perform an ELISA on the surface of that bead. What do I mean by that? Well, um, here in this uh, cytokine bead assay, we've got two different beads here of two different sizes, and they are coated in the capture antibody. I've got another video on ELISAs if you wanted a quick um, brush up on what an ELISA is, um, but uh, you should understand it based on this video. So we have two beads here and they are coated in an antibody. Now let's say this bead here is very large and it might be coated in an IL-6 antibody, an interleukin-6 antibody which is an inflammatory cytokine. Um, so this is going to bind any IL-6 molecules. Here we have a bead, it's much smaller and it has an it's coated in antibodies that will bind to IL-1, which is a very, very inflammatory cytokine, right? So this bead here is going to bind to and capture, um, this bead here is going to bind to and capture the IL-1 protein. So we've got a large one here with uh, anti-IL-6 antibodies and a small one here with anti-IL-1 antibodies. So let's say we wanted to see how much IL-6 and IL-1 was in someone's plasma who had SARS-CoV-2, for example. We would take their blood, we would centrifuge it, so all the cells fall to the bottom, and then we would take their plasma to see how much inflammatory cytokines are floating around that plasma. We would take just their plasma, we don't want their cells, and we will add those beads to the plasma. So now there are beads, those beads there, that with the antibodies attached to them, are floating around that patient's plasma. Remember that anti-IL-6, and anti-IL-1 um, antibodies attached to those two different kinds of beads. Now, while they're in solution, they are going to grab, um, and they are going to grab the IL-6 or the IL-1 will bind it to those antibodies. So we'll leave it there for an hour or so, uh, maybe overnight, and gradually those proteins will bind it to those antibodies. Then we will centrifuge it. Now this is a human centrifuge. They use it for pilot training. So there is a person in there and they're getting spun really quickly. And that basically mimics a really high gravity environment. So we call it G's. Um, and in this person, the blood has been pulled out of their brain, which has caused them to faint. But, so we're not gonna do that to ourselves. We're gonna do that to our sample. So the heavy beads, like the blood in that guy's body, is going to spin and pull down in the centrifuge and end up down the bottom there. So those beads are now clustered at the bottom of the tube, and we can now remove that liquid and replace it with a new liquid. So we wash the beads, we actually spin it a few times, and then we replace them with a liquid that contains another antibody, but this time with a fluorescent probe attached to it. And this antibody will be the IL-6 antibody, so it too will bind to the IL-6, uh, molecule here that's been captured on the speed and we have an IL-1 antibody here with a fluorescent probe that's binding to the IL-1 here which has been captured on this speed. And in this case you can see that there's more interleukin-1 beta than there is bound to this antibody, there's more interleukin-1 bound to these antibodies than there is IL-6 bound to these antibodies. We then take those beads and run them through a flow cytometry machine. So they get sucked up, they come down, they come down this tube and they go through the first laser. And the first laser, remember, is looking at size. So it looks at how much this light is reduced as it goes through the speed. And the first thing that you'll notice is that this is a large bead, so it reduces the light a lot. So the forward scatter is a lot. It will then go down to the fluorescent label laser and we'll see that there is some IL-6 so there are some antibodies there binding to that IL-6. 
with a fluorescent probe on so we end up with some green light coming through the filter and hitting the sensor. Now if we have the small bead, it lets a lot of light through. So it has a low level of that forward scatter molecule, uh, that forward scatter measurement. So we end up with a lot of light getting through to that sensor. It will then go down to the uh, fluorescent laser, but this time there was much more IL-1, if you remember, than there was IL-6. So much more green light will be emitted and get through the filter and hit that sensor. So we will re record this particle as both small and covered in lots of green fluorescent probes. So now we can run that on that same graph here. So here we've got a graph um, that, here we've got a point that's very high, so it's got a very large cell size, and that's because it was on the big bead, right? It was on the big bead, so it's big and slightly fluorescent. So we know that there's some IL-6, not a huge amount, but we know because the bead was big, that's IL-6, and it didn't fluoresce that much, so then we've got some IL-6. The IL-1 bead is small, so we know that this is the IL-1 bead here, and it had loads of fluorescence. So we know that there was loads of IL-1 in this person's plasma, but not a lot of IL-6 in this plasma, which is unlikely for biological reasons, because IL-1 induces IL-6. But anyway, it was just a random example. So it's small and highly fluorescent, so we know that there's lots of IL-1. Um, so essentially, you can see it's basically an ELISA on the surface of a bead. But here's what's really clever. They can actually start putting more and more different kinds of beads in here. So remember, we show it with a green laser, but there's lots of lasers and lots of sensors in a flow cytometry machine. So here, they've got a bead that fluoresces orange and is large, and a bead that fluoresces orange and is small. So we can now distinguish these beads based on color, and these beads based on size, and these beads based on color. So now we can actually start to probe for even more antibodies. So in this example, we've got capture antibodies for TNF-alpha, um, and this we've got capture antibodies for IL-2, more inflammatory cytokines, essentially. This is sort of a T-cell um, activating a cytokine here. Um, so now we can put all four beads into the plasma sample. And so this is where cytokine bead assays start to outperform ELISAs because you can put many, many beads of different sizes and colors into the um, plasma to measure many different cytokines simultaneously, whereas an ELISA can only measure one cytokine at a time. And you can actually put it in really small volumes of plasma, whereas an ELISA does require at least 50 microliters of plasma, right? So, um, uh, whereas cytokine bead assays can do much smaller volumes of plasma. So there's a huge advantage. You can get lots of measurements from not a lot of samples. I will say, from my personal experience, cytokine bead assays are more variable than ELISAs. So you tend to get bigger error bars when you do your assay, which makes you a little bit less likely to get statistical significance, and it means to get good statistical power, you need a few more samples in your experiment. So if it was a mouse experiment, you need to use more mice. If it was a human experiment, you'd need more patients in your clinical trial. So you need to weigh up the balance there. Do you want to do a cytokine bead assay, or do you want to do an ELISA, which has smaller error bars, but requires a lot more uh, samples? Yeah, so that's the cytokine bead assay. Oh yeah, one more slide. Um, so to, pu to perfectly quantify this, right, we need some sort of reference to compare our fluorescent sample to. We can't just say high fluorescence equals high, high IL-1. How much IL-1 does that mean? And so for each cytokine, we run a standard curve um, in a different um, in a different tube, we run a standard curve, and in that standard curve, there is a known amount of each cytokine, and we dilute that out, and so we know um, this is the concentration of each of our standards, um, and this is how much fluorescence we got, and so therefore, in our unknown sample, in our patient's plasma, we got this amount of fluorescence, which means we've got this amount of cytokines, right? So we need to run a standard curve for each of the cytokines um, in the cytokine bead assay. Brilliant, yep, so that's it. That's how to do a cytokine bead assay. And also, as a bonus, you learned flow cytometry. Thanks a lot, guys.